it was just, I read it, I thought it was beautiful, I thought it was really moving, I thought the journey that the members of Queen went through, I thought that um, John Deacon was so interesting, he's a little bit of an enigma, because he has oddly a lot of say in, in the band, he has oddly sort of a tiebreaker's role when the three of them kind of argue. As long as you can make the words that you say and the scenes that you have fit those, again, sort of macro things that you know about him, I think that's sort of the way, the way in um, to playing a character who, who is alive and is well known and who people are going to have strong opinions about. The very first thing I did was put on a wig. And I put on the wig, and it wasn't even like attached to my head, it was just put on me. And I looked at myself in the mirror and I was like, I am John Deacon. I'm John. I looked suddenly exactly like him. It was absolutely wild. We know that a lot of the people watching this are gonna be Queen fanatics, they're gonna be musicians. I can't tell you how many bassists have come up to me and asked me if I'm playing the songs, and I knew I had to do it. And I couldn't be faking it. You'll know if someone's just kind of going like this and smiling. And, and it's just like also as an actor, you want to be up there on the stage feeling like you're playing these songs, which, which you are. Um, and um, it was, a, again, it was just another piece of why this was just so much fun and I was looking forward to it so much and why it was just a challenge that I relished. He had such a vision, I think, for what he wanted the band to be. And, you know, it, it, it shows. I think that there was, he wouldn't accept them ever being a small time rock band. They were going to be the biggest band in the world and he felt that way from the moment he was singing in his bathroom um, to when he's on the stage at Live Aid. It was just, you know, a direct line that he knew would, would kind of always occur. And so, obviously, he has, like, what, a 20-octave range uh, as well. So, I mean, the guys kind of knew. And, you know, everyone wrote songs, right? So John wrote songs. John couldn't really sing. But he knew he could write anything because Freddie would be able to sing it. Even the producers were out there, like, you know, <laughs> Dennis O'Sullivan, Graham King, out there doing the moves to Radio Gaga. They were like, oh, we need is Radio Gaga. I'm like, these are guys, that, oh, Scorsese's producer is out there doing the moves to Radio Gaga for us to give us, like, the motivation and to, like, get us into it. It was, like, that kind of thing where you just felt like the whole team was together and loving it and you were there and it was, a, it was big and you were there for, like, this, like, reason that was bigger than yourself. To be able to have, you know, you know, Roger and, and Brian there to help me even, you know, to, to tell me things about, about, you know, kind of John's journey through all of this and to just be there as a resource um, and as kind of just someone you could, you could ask anything to and someone there to just like remember why you're here, right? You do a job for four, five months, maybe you lose a little focus, maybe other things start to, you know, the distractions of whatever happens on set. Having them come back and being just as enthusiastic about it and, and you know, there for us as much as they were the first day, it just kind of like recenters you and makes you go, right, we are doing this for them. To have Freddie Mercury as your lead vocalist who can sing at anything, and by the way, Roger Taylor can also hit, you know, a note that breaks glass and, you know, makes dogs shriek. Um, to put, to load that up also with Brian May's kind of like smooth, more soulful voice, and that three-part harmony comes out, that's, it's an unmistakable sound that the moment you hear, you say Queen. And so to, again, to have that thing that's very identifiable while also not boring your audience with the same song over and over again, to grow, to change, but to still have the core that is you, I think has allowed them to just sort of, you know, from generation to generation to generation, you find something new in their music that you can hold on to and, you know, kind of stake as a claim to it. It's fun, it's light, it's funny, but then, oh, that's undercut by these moments of drama. And just when you kind of maybe can't take that anymore, oh, there's levity and something comes back up. And so 
hopefully you kind of go through that entire journey when you watch the movie and you leave just wanting to get in your car and blast Queen with the windows down. Hi there, so did you like the video? Well, stay with me as I have a bonus, if somewhat controversial, behind the scenes movie fact for you. D.W. Griffith, a pioneering Hollywood film director, is credited with using the first close-up, the long shot, the fade-out, and other film techniques in his 1915 groundbreaking and highly racist film, The Birth of a Nation, aka The Klansman, a film that portrayed the Ku Klux Klan in a positive way. What's your favorite all-time movie? Let me know in the comments below. And remember, we publish new videos every day, so be sure to subscribe for more great content. See you next time.